So what I want to talk about today here is um, I want to present a bit of a model of reality that I like to work with that I've found extremely helpful in understanding uh, what spirituality is all about, especially in terms of religious or spiritual experiences. So that's going to be uh, the theme here. So to begin with, um, you know, throughout history for the past what, four or five hundred years or so, uh, we've had this intense debate between religion and science in terms of what constitutes reality. Is there indeed a spiritual dimension or is there simply this material physical world? And that has been, of course, led to a lot of the debate and conflict between so-called uh, conflict between religion and science. But I think that can be resolved if, if we just have a more expansive, more comprehensive model of reality. And this is what I'm trying to bring here, is um, a bit of an overview of that. Now, my inspiration for this idea uh, about four levels of reality comes from Serge King. He's a Hawaiian shaman who presented it in an article in a book on shamanism, where he outlines that the shamans of Hawaii, the, all right, also known as the Huna tradition, uh, they held that there are four basic levels to reality. And this is what I'm going to go through in more detail here in a sec. But the ordinary reality of this objective world of separate material things. Uh, secondly, the psychic reality of everything being energy. The third level of reality being a type of dream world where everything is uh, basically represents a type of symbol or message that there are patterns of meaning. And then a holistic reality. Uh, that is the source of it all, where everything is one interconnected whole. Whoops. I went way long way. Where am I going here? Oh, no, here we go. And so the first fundamental level is the world of matter, this physical material world, what we often regard our everyday ordinary reality. And this is the objective world of separate material things, the world of the five senses. And, um, and this is the level of reality that science focuses on. And often, in the name of science, many would hold that this is all there is to reality. At least this has been, you know, the traditional perspective for a few hundred years, which now quantum physics and quantum theory is showing that it's not. <laughs> in fact, matter has been dematerialized. Uh, but still, many people operate from the assumption that this is all there is, is this physical material world of the five senses. If you can't he see, hear, smell, touch it, measure it in some way, it doesn't exist. And of course, religion has always been dealing with another dimension of reality that goes beyond that. So the second level of reality is the world of energy. And this is what we're tuning into more and more. We've come to understand increasingly this realm in recent uh, decades, well, the past hundred years, really, that behind this physical, visible material world, there lies sort of an energetic blueprint that is really orchestrating the material world in a sense. This is the world of varying vibrational frequencies that largely we can't see with the naked eye, but we've got now all kinds of technology that can detect these energy fields. Even though there are those like psychics who are able to see energy fields around things like seeing auras and whatnot, right? And so just imagine, just to kind of clear this up, imagine that you know, you, you'd see a little meadow you know, there's a little field here with grasses and flowers, and then there's some trees and say there's a big boulder there. And then you'll see, you know, there's a flower and a butterfly comes and lands on that flower. Now from the physical level of material reality, what reality consists of are just these separate objects of grass, flower, butterfly, rock, okay? But if you could translate that in terms of energy fields, and what psych some psychics might be able to see and definitely what different uh, uh, technology can pick up on is that you'd see that there's an energy field around that flower, an energy field around that butterfly, around the grasses, around that boulder. Right? And you could see that as the butterfly lands on the boulder, then flies over to the flower, you can kind of see the interaction of these energy fields. And this is the world of energy that some people naturally and very easily can kind of pick up and feel out. Right? And we'll talk a little bit later, but this is sort of what intuition is all, often all about. Okay, but that's the world of energy. That's the second level of reality. 
Then there's the third level of reality. I like to call it the world of dreams. And as you perhaps know, many more indigenous traditions like classic ones are the Australian Aborigines who talk about the dream world as being the real world. <laughs> uh, that's a very common thing is that uh, that realm of imagination, that realm you enter into when you dream, when you go into a certain meditative state and, and enter this field that's in the mind that you access through your imagination, it is a type of reality that exists on its own terms. It's a different type of reality. But it's not just mere, you know, hallucinations, the way we think of hallucinations. Uh, there is a reality to it. And this is what shamans often work with to shift reality, all right, to bring about changes, to do healing work, uh, to find things out about the future, to access different forms and levels of information. This level is extremely important in the history of religion um, and in terms of, you know, spiritual experiences, understanding them. So this is a level of reality, okay, this dream world, where uh, reality can kind of show up in terms of synchronicities where what's going on for you in your consciousness can get become interlinked with what shows up in the outer world okay there's a bit of a lineup that happens and and you can tune in to things in the outer world to receive messages information guidance okay as to something that might pertain to your personal life something that might be important for the community uh, on or on a larger scale there will be messages that will show up in the outer world that you can tap into, just as there are messages within the inner world. And these messages are meaningful patterns, all right, uh, often symbolic in nature through the use of, you know, sort of metaphors. And not going into this here, I'm, I'm going to create another video along this in terms of synchronicities, <laughs> understanding how that all works. Uh, but this is where in the ancients, you know, they've all had their experts who could read the signs, the omens out there in the outer world that would bring us important information. And also there were those who had, were, had expertise and they encyclopedias on dream interpretation on all ancient societies of what your dreams mean. They carry messages of various kinds. So it's these kind of patterns of meaning that exist both in the outer world and the inner world, what we call the physical world and within the human psyche of consciousness, okay? Consciousness and matter uh, can exhibit these patterns of meaning that engage our imagination to uh, decode those patterns, decode the symbolism and metaphors that are at play there, okay? And that's very much an important level of reality that A, in some sense, it's subjective, it's tied in with consciousness, but yet there's also objectivity to it. It's something that also just transcends the self in terms of sometimes using the outer world or, uh, having a meaning, uh, bringing information that goes beyond your present conscious awareness, okay? It has that transcendent uh, uh, aspect to it. And this is what's so important about it. Okay, hopefully that makes some sense. Then the fourth level of reality is the world of oneness, uh, where reality also exhibits this property of interconnectedness that this is sort of that level of reality that's sort of the deepest level where it seems as though we're getting at the primal source of all that is, where there's a sense of what often is called quantum entanglement uh, and interconnectedness between all things. Right? That's that deep level of reality where it functions as an interconnected web. And that's why in so many traditions you have talk of, of the body being like a microcosm, a miniature version of the larger universe. Uh, or an animal could be a miniature version of the larger universe. You'll see this in Hindu rituals. Uh, this is how magic then can work, is these kinds of correlations between the color red with the planet Mars. <laughs> and there's a web of interconnectedness between things. And to understand that web and knowing how to work with it, right, you can then shift reality. That's so much of what religious practices have entailed throughout history. Okay, so hopefully that makes some sense, these four levels of reality here. So what happens here in this 
debate between religion and science, that has been a debate, <laughs> is the, the problem of reductionism is what's taking place, where uh, people tend to um, uh, reduce things to being only and totally this one thing. So for example, saying that all there is to reality is just the physical world, the material world. And so they reduce the totality of reality to that one level. Then the opposite can be true to say that, oh, all is one, everything is interconnected. This physical world is merely an illusion, a hallucination, okay? It's not just a dream, but it's even not even real in any kind of a way, right? That's always the opposite extreme of denying any reality to, you know, that truck coming down the street. And if you step in front of it, it's gonna kill you. <laughs> and to say that, oh, it's just an illusion. No, it's real. Okay, uh, so there's a type of reductionism that even the super spiritual people make by reducing everything to just, oh, it's all one, all one and the same. No, it's not all one and the same, all right? There is difference and yet interconnectedness. It's more complex than that, all right? So, so this is a big problem here, is that of reductionism from all sides. Uh, we create confusion and distortions when we fail to recognize the validity of all four perspectives or all four levels of reality. And so here, the classic uh, parable that's used for this is about the four blind men, you know, and the elephant, you know, some say just being able to access one part, like the trunk, uh, and saying it's a snake, uh, one who holds the tail and says this is a rope, <laughs> all right, one just feels the side of the elephant and says it's a wall, right, so you'll have them just reducing the whole into that one part that they have access to, assuming that it represents the whole, and this is a common mistake made everywhere on all kinds of topics and issues, um, and that's why we often have conflicts and debates. We always need to have more of a comprehensive understanding of things instead of a simplistic reductionistic approach. Now, added on to this model of reality, we need to understand the nature of the brain. <laughs> that we basically have two minds. And because the thing that I've noted here is that when you assume that all that exists is this material world, then science as a method, which is, that's all what science is, is a particular type of method that is very well suited to a particular type of reality, okay? And it largely utilizes a certain aspect, a certain part of the brain. Uh, whereas other levels of reality, they tend to access and utilize and require your tuning in other parts of the brain that are suitable for accessing that level of reality, okay? So basically we have, you know, and you're I'm sure aware that we have the left brain hemisphere and the right brain hemisphere. And they're in a sense, two types of minds, right? In, in a general sense, okay? Uh, and they, um, activate and are usually correlated with a certain kind of mode of consciousness or a certain way of perceiving reality, so to speak. So you've got the uh, left brain hemisphere, which is sort of more the logical mind that we could say opti um, optimizes and activates what we can call the objective mode of consciousness or perception. And then there's the right brain hemisphere or the more intuitive mind that uh, activates and operates from a receptive mode of perception or consciousness. And I'll go through this in a little bit more. So the logical mind, the left brain is more associated, you know, with the left brain is the doing part of us of going into action uh, is very logical, verbal, analytical, likes to reduce things to their parts, you know, have things working through it, through things logically, is tied in very much with words, if it's very linear, tied in with mathematics, okay, uh, looks at what's very obvious and measurable and concrete, okay, uh, that's sort of the lo logical kind of mind at play here, and, and that is when, that's largely what our ordinary everyday consciousness, you know, we tend to be in that mode of operation, what we can call the objective mode, where we see the world out there, as something out there, and it's something that I can work on and manipulate and direct, you know, in various ways, okay? And um, yeah, then on the other hand, 
is the more intuitive mind, which is more focused on being as opposed to doing. Okay, uh, it's associated with the right brain hemisphere. And here you also have just a little bit, bit of a picture that gives you the various descriptors associated with each. But it's tied in more with imagination and the arts and music pictures, right? It deals with things in, in a more holistic fashion instead of reducing things to the parts. It's associated more with feelings instead of logic and analysis. Uh, so more with symbolism and poetry, right? And it is that receptive mode that is about us in our beingness and how we feel. And we tend to feel the world around us. And the world will show us things in terms of pictures and what we feel, as opposed to the world telling us things through words. And so I really uh, um, appreciated one time in a video I watched on shamanism where the shaman said, uh, you Westerners, when you go out into the forest, you just go out there and just see trees. When we go out into the forest, we feel the forest. We feel the trees and feel the birds and the flowers and whatever else is there. They go into this feeling mode. That's the receptive mode, okay? A receptive mode of consciousness. And that's where, again, a lot of spiritual practices you know, prayers and meditation and whatnot, they're meant to assist you to shift from that objective, logical, everyday consciousness mode and the doing mode into the receptive mode, the intuitive mind, all right? So that you're kind of more receptive and able to tune in to the deeper level of reality beyond the physical appearance of things. You're able to more to tune in and feel the energies and be receptive to images, metaphors, just different things coming up and then seeing them, seeing the symbolism behind things through using your imagination, how the different parts come together into a whole, right? Uh, that's a lot of what goes on there. And just as a little side note, uh, just some things I just came across recently here uh, about meditation, what's been found is that what meditation does, like deep, real meditation, what a lot of people do when they think they're meditating, they're really not meditating. <laughs> they're just beginning to, right, or trying to. Uh, but when you truly go into a deeper meditation and that state of mind that's associated with it, right, um, it's 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 a it's a type of state that's not associated with sleep, waking, or dreams. Uh, it's its own kind of higher state or deeper state, whatever you want to call it. But what happens is the whole of the brain lights up. And that seems to indicate that the whole of the brain is activated, but also coming into coherence. It's a huge thing, a connection between the left and the right brain. So the two are kind of coming into coherence and can work together. Right? It's really you're coming into whole brain knowing using the whole of your brain, which is really what we should try to do. Um, and what we, they've also found is that the corpus callosum, which is that it's sort of a, a, a band of nerve fibers that connect the two brain hemispheres, that through uh, regular meditation that gets thicker and it gets stronger, which means that there is greater interconnectedness between the two brain hemisphere, okay? Now, when you enter into that deeper meditative state and that state of coherence, right? That's why many people, I love to call it the zero point field. You know, it's so hard to describe, but it's kind of like the zero point of just pure beingness in a sense, right? You're not thinking of anything, of it's just pure beingness. And it's also blissful, <laughs> how they describe samadhi, the state of samadhi in Hinduism. You know, it's, it's pure beingness, it's pure blissful. And it is a type of consciousness, it's pure consciousness. Uh, it has profound healing effects. It's like the stress in your body of like, eh, 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 for, uh, tied in with action and coercion and doing and doing and frustration and fighting and da, 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 all these stresses. You know, and then what I like to do is I just say, be undone, undo, 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 just relax, you know, focus in the body, just relax every strained muscle and just undo, undo as much as you can to just let it all go. And you come into coherence, <laughs> okay? That brings healing, healing to the body. Uh, it just it gets rid of all this stress. It sort of gets flushed out, right? 
and uh, even things of the past right up to the present it gets undone released and and all those different tensions conflicts stressors right they, they, they got a grip on you and they're sapping some of your energy. Um, you know, it's like having a lot of things plugged in and it's just sucking the life out of you. And it's like, get, un oops, sorry, get unplugged, get unplugged. Allow to, yourself to come into coherence and healing. And then your strength will rebuild. The creativity will open up. Your mind will open up and become more active. That's why, you know, if you're stressed out during exams, is again, that stress, anxiety, it shuts down your brain and literally makes you stupid. Stress makes you stupid and makes you sick. <laughs> All right. And it's so important to kind of clear that out so that, ah, oh, when you get relaxed and calm, all right, there's sh things shift in the brain so that, you know, the, uh, the uh, um, frontal corp, um, oh gosh, I can't even think here. It opens up for you. My words don't come. And, and you can think again, right? And you'll remember what you need to remember for the exam. So anyways, healing is what deep reju rejuvenation takes place, even deeper than sleep. They say that, you know, if you go into deep meditation, it's more effective for, in rejuvenating you than two to five times more than sleep. Okay, so in some, you're going to be more empowered in life uh, through this. And so again, throughout history, you know, we have these practices and teachings always associated with religion and spirituality. So the whole point here is we need both minds. Okay, because uh, again, that's where sometimes there's been sort of a type of extremism, if you like, where it's so right brain at the abandonment of the left brain. <laughs> Okay, just like with reductionism, people just like, well, just go in a cave and meditate for 40 years and ta-da. It's like, well, there's more to life, I believe, uh, that there's a reason why we're here in a physical body, and we're meant to embody that and embrace it and do good in the world and bring about an integration of the spiritual and the physical, right? It's about integrating the two, not abandoning the one for the sake of the other, okay, which, you know, you can find the both extremes there from the atheist materialist, abandoning anything spiritual or intuitive, you know, and certain spiritual people, that's a type of escapism. Spiritual bypassing is easy to just tune out of the, the challenges and struggles of being a human and really taking on the human journey, abandoning that, and just tune out and be in a cave and meditate for 40 years. Um, you know, it's like, hey, why are you here? What is the purpose of life, right? Again, I could easily go off into another topic on that. I, and I believe it's the purpose of life is the joy of being, just to put that in there. But anyway, uh, we need both minds. The logical mind can put forth ah, the intention, the direction, the request for information, for guidance, whatever it's needed. It's sort of like the CEO, okay? The director of your life. And then the intuitive mind is there to serve you, uh, to bring you that information, that guidance, the healing, the empowerment, whatever that it is that you need, it there is there meant to serve you, but you need to know how to work it, how to use it. Okay. Um, and then of course, in the logical mind will assess and work it out and create then the plan to apply uh, what gets received, generally speaking. Okay. All right. And so, uh, and here, this is all tied in with intuition. So what is uh, just a little bit of a definition of how I see intuition? Uh, intuition is a type of body wisdom that comes from just our connection, you know, spiritual connection to the energetic matrix of the universe itself, which I feel is a energy, but also consciousness, the universal mind, and is both to use the God word, if you like, both God imminent and transcendent, okay? Both personal and a bit more abstract, okay? It encompasses both, it's not either or, but both. And intuition kind of picks up on that and then can translate things into senses, feelings that you have, sometimes pictures, sometimes words, okay? Messages, ideas, then you kind of are receptors, like an antenna going out, you kind of pick this stuff up and it translates things into various forms. Sometimes you'll hear a word spoken to you, all right? I mean, I've yeah, had many experiences, or you'll have a vision, uh, you know, all kinds of things I have, and just a gut sense about things. Uh, it's amazing, it's wonderful. So that's how it kind of fits in. It just tunes into those deeper levels of reality, and it's largely more associated with the right brain hemisphere. 
Okay, so intuition and spirituality, uh, uh, working with the right brain hemisphere, the intuitive mind, okay, is very much associated here always with spirituality because uh, what we're dealing here, we're dealing with that unseen aspect of reality, that which is largely hidden to the physical eye, the non-obvious, it's that which transcends, is metaphysical, or what I like to use, trans-empirical in nature. And intuition is what allows us to tune into that deeper level of reality where things are moving, happening, and we kind of pick up on it at that energetic level uh, before it actually manifests physically so we can know ahead of time what's happening, okay? Because it can transcend time and space limitations. And that's the key reason, as I often say, why religion has had such power in human societies and in the human journey across time and space is it provides for us the ability to transcend the usual limitations we have to time and space. So we can acquire higher forms and levels of knowledge and information for guidance, okay, as well as higher levels of healing, uh, ability to heal and be empowered and strengthened and to overcome you know, our usual physical limitations in all kinds of ways. So I think I'm at the end here, whoops. Um, yeah, so then in a sense here, I think uh, this is the last slide. Our bodies pick up energy from the surrounding environment, like I was saying, like an antenna and translates that information into sensations, imagery and words. And these are internal cues, right? But then also the universe out there can communicate us, to us through symbols, synchronicities, how things kind of line up that have a message and, uh, and that kind of can line up with, wow, what do I need right now in my life? What do I need to know? Uh, what kind of guidance do I need, right? And some kind of meaningful event, a synchronicity will show up that will be a clue that will guide me as to, aha, this is the direction I need to go. Okay, those are external cues. Okay, so this is how uh, some of this stuff works. I hope you find this um, worthwhile <laughs> and uh yeah that's what i put together and uh thanks for watching ciao